Our scripture reading today is from Mark, chapter 6, verses 14 to 44. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he is Elijah, and others said he is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry but because of his oath and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up in heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were five thousand men. This is the gospel of the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we continue our sermon series, which is based on the gospel of Mark. Uh, and we know that Mark was not one of the twelve. He is... Uh, 
an evangelist and he is a companion of the apostle Peter. And basically the gospel of Mark is the gospel of Peter. All the testimonies, uh, all the stories we read in the gospel of Mark are experienced by Peter. So we know that the gospel of Mark was written about 64 AD. This is when the Roman government in the person of the emperor Nero starts persecuting Christians for the hatred of humankind. Now, to believe in Jesus, it's not just personal choice. It's not your private matter. Now the government has a problem with that. So what do you do in that situation? Do you keep being a Christian? Uh, do you keep professing your faith in Jesus Christ? Or do you just decide to calmly depart and just live your life with no Jesus? That was a big question. What do we as Christians choose? Well, the Christians in Rome, they decided to die for Jesus and the Holy Spirit was encouraging them through the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark was read by Romans by the Roman Christians, and they were encouraged and inspired, and they knew who Jesus was. Because from the very beginning, we see that Jesus is the true king, and he is not like other teachers or rabbis. He has authority. He has power. He, he's different. He can heal people. He can, you know, cast out demons. He, can, he has control over natural forces, uh, over nature and he can even raise people from the dead. So their choice was to die for Jesus because Jesus is a true king and they knew that Jesus will give them new bodies. Jesus will resurrect them. They will be with Jesus in eternity. So that is a question that we Christians today should ask ourselves. What happens if our governments are not happy with Christ and us being Christians. I hope that we can find encouragement and inspiration in the Gospel of Mark. So, from the very beginning, we see that Jesus does his ministry in Galilee. And now today's Gospel reading, we have two stories. One is about Herod and John the Baptist, and the other one is about Jesus feeding 5,000 people. So all that was happening in the region of Galilee, and you can see this is Galilee, and you can see the Sea of Galilee, which is a large lake, or well, relatively large, so it's only six mile, miles wide and 13 miles long, you know? It's, it's a big lake, but not too big. And we see many of the events, many of the things that, or stories in the gospel, they happened in Galilee. Now, Galilee had a ruler, and the ruler's name was Herod. And we have quite a few Herods in the Bible. So this Herod was Herod Antipas, and he was son of Herod the Great. You remember Herod the Great, the one who ordered the killing of all the babies in you know, Bethlehem. That was his dad, yeah, Herod the Great. So this one is Herod Antipas. So he killed John the Baptist. Why? Now, I want you to look at this story and think about the dynamics, you know, of, of, of relationships between people of God holy people, righteous people, I would say Christians nowadays, true Christians, and the government, the authorities, and rulers. And what we see in the story is something very interesting. So now we see that Jesus does all the, you know, all the wonderful things and miracles and, you know, mighty works. And King Herod, which is Herod Antipas, he heard of it. For Jesus' name had become known. And some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. This is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. 
And this is John the Baptist, how they portray him. And you know that he lived in the wilderness and uh, he didn't have any luxury items and normal clothes. He would eat, you know, insects and wild um, honey. So he was the prophet of God. He baptized Jesus. He said that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, right? So he he is very important. Even later, you know, Jews, those who didn't believe in Jesus, they saw John the Baptist, Baptist as a very important figure. Josephus, the Roman historian who is a Jew, captured Jew, he mentions John the Baptist and how important he was. So now, some think that Jesus is the reincarnation of John the Baptist, but others say he's Elijah, another prophet from the Old Testament. And others said he's a prophet like one of the prophets of old. And then Mark tells us the story of John the Baptist and how he died. So on the one hand, we have this Herod, Antipas. And we learn very quickly that the problem is his marriage to uh, Herodias. And Herodias, uh, she is his niece, and she was married to his brother Philip first, right? And we didn't see that in the Gospels, but he, Herod, at some point traveled to Rome. And, you know, he was a small ruler and Romans appointed him to be a ruler of this uh, territory. So from time to time, he travels to Rome. So he travels to Rome. In Rome, he meets Herodias and she's married to his, uh, to his brother. So now they fall in love with each other and Herod divorces his wife, abandons and divorces his wife. And then uh, Herodias, uh, so she... she abandons and divorces her husband, and they uh, start living together. So according to Leviticus, the book of Leviticus, the law of Moses, it is a sin. You're not supposed to do things like that. And John the Baptist, he knows that, and he tells that uh, openly. He kind of rebukes and, uh, and uh, calls to repentance the ruler and his family, so the government, right? So Herodias, she's not happy about that, and she wants this man to close, to shut his mouth, and he doesn't. He listens to God. And here we see this conflict between the holy person who obeys the Lord and the government that does perverted things against the law of God does whatever they desire, what they want to do. So if you think about today's days, uh, we will see the similar uh, problem. We will see this tension between people who want to be faithful to the Lord, to the law of God, and the government that may be wishing to do things that are against the law of God, things that are based on their own desires. Uh, and sometimes sinful desires, right? So, and they are rulers, they are the government, right? And they make laws and they have power, but they, what they do is against God's will, is against God's law. So now, what do we, if we are holy and righteous people, how do we behave in relation to the government? So John the Baptist he spoke the truth. And of course, Herodias was trying to use all her power, you know, her influence to silence him, but he wouldn't. So now he ends up in prison because of that. She wants him dead, but Herod is not ready to kill him because he still has this fear of God. Yes, he sinned, he did wrong, wrong things, but he still, he has fear of God. He, he's afraid to, to harm John the Baptist. So Herodias, on the other hand, we can see that she is already is so perverted in her desires that she asks her daughter 
to ask the head, you know, it's a daughter, right? So it's a child or a young daughter, right? So it's her child, and she asks her to ask the head of John the Baptist on a platter. What a terrible request. It's a horrifying request, right? So, but that just shows you that when you are possessed by certain sin or perversion, you can go all the way down into the abyss, into the darkness, and be absolutely dehumanized or lose your image, you know. The image of God is so tainted in you or darkened, it's no longer visible. So that happens today in our lives as well. The same story. You know, there are people who rule over us and they are not necessarily have the image of God shining in them, right? So they may be in dark places, spiritually speaking evil places. So you will see that challenge. Now, John the Baptist was willing uh, to suffer, and he even died, you know, for the truth and his faithfulness to God. Are we willing to be the same? Are we willing to be John the Baptists in our days? That's a good question to ask ourselves. So let us very quickly go over the story. So we see this is Herod and Herodias, uh, by the way, you know, uh, it's not in the Gospels, but we know uh, the end of this relationship. So now what happens of this couple, let me, uh, let me clarify, this couple. What happens, the previous wife of Herod, she, wasn't, she, she also was a princess. She was a daughter of a different king. So that king was not happy that Herod divorced his daughter he divorced his daughter and kind of disgraced her so when his daughter is back in his kingdom he starts a war with herod and herod loses so very quickly romans no longer interested in herod and they take away this kingship from him so he ends up in exile with herodias and nobody knows where they died no power no riches no nothing, no influence. So this is the end of this couple, historically speaking. We read in the text, in the gospel, we see why Herod killed John. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful, according to the law of Moses, for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she could not. For Herod feared John knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came for Herodias when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' his daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod, and his guests. And this is she dancing. You know, she danced. And again, you see, it's not about virtue or being, you know, it's, it's not about noble virtues. It's not about, you know, wisdom and reason and courage and uh, uh, honor. No, no, no. It's about, you know, sensual desires. Yeah, he saw a girl, you know, dancing for him. And then he makes all kinds of promises. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, up to half of my kingdom. It's boastful, you know, it's not, it's not reasonable. And she went out, probably he had a couple of beers, or I don't know, or vodkas or something, you know. But he was just saying all those things, right? And she went out and said to her, Mother, for what shall I should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. Oh, terrible. And she came and immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner 
with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. You see, it's demonic. It's satanic. It's, it's, it's not human. It's not, it's not coming from God. So it's just... And gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. So this is, this is the story of John the Baptist. But very quickly, we will see that Jesus is also confronted by authorities and government, right? And very quickly, Jesus will be executed by the Roman authorities as well. So, which kind of tells us that in the life of holy and righteous people, and even in the life of Son of God himself, there is place for suffering and martyrdom. Martyrdom. Not everything is just, you know, uh, roses and, you know, uh, nice, you know flowers. So, th there is place for martyrdom and suffering for the truth. And the next, what we learn in the Gospel of Mark, in our Gospel reading, uh, he tells us about Jesus feeding 5,000 people. And he already knows, so it's the map of uh, Israel. Uh, so Jerusalem at the bottom, Samaria in the middle, and Galilee at the top. And in Galilee, we see Nazareth, which is Jesus' hometown, and we see Capernaum, where Jesus it was his head, the quarters, and he performed a lot of miracles there. And then we also see Bethsaida. So, and what we're reading today will be happening in the area of Bethsaida, in that region, the feeding of the 5,000 people. So now, they not always walked. Very often, they, because they had boats, they would m move from place to place using boats. For, for, for example, from Capernaum, to Bethsaida, they could use a boat, right? So we read about that in the Gospels. Now, we also know that Jesus, at this point, he is no longer walking around and preaching and teaching himself. He sends out the twelve, his disciples, and now they preach and teach, and they perform miracles, and they cast out demons, and they heal the sick, right? The, we can see how the, 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 their mission the, the, the kingdom of God is expanding and growing. And, and what we read next is about that. And this is another map that shows you a little bit closer. So where Jesus uh, feeds, you know, 5,000 people. It's in the area of Beth Beth Bethsaida. Okay. So now Jesus sends the apostles out. They preach and teach. And now in verse 30, we see that the apostles return to Jesus. Now, the Herod hears about Jesus and he thinks that it's John the Baptist. And the apostles, they returned to Jesus and told him, told him all that they had done and taught. They give him reports. And, and I, want to see, I want you to see in this uh, section how loving, compassionate, Jesus is, but also I want you to see that Jesus is God of order, not disorder. He's a God of order. It's interesting how he interacts with the apostles. Okay, it's interesting. So he now, he has the 12 and he sends them out and they faithfully do what he told them to do. And now they're coming back and they give him reports. And this is what he says next. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. Well, he cares not about, not just about his mission, he also wants them to have some rest, right? Because they've been working really hard. So Jesus is taking care of all those things and he thinks about those things. Not just work, but also rest, okay? There are so many people who think, oh, oh I will be working for Jesus or doing something and they just... Uh, have no rest and they burned out. So rest is also very important. We see that Jesus tells us, come, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. And then he explains why. For many were coming and going and they had no uh, pleasure, no free time uh, even to eat. This is how hard they were working. So now this phrase, for many were coming and going, 
I want you uh, to I want you to pause here for a second and think about this miracle, Jesus feeding 5,000 people. We see in that each gospel writer tells us about this miracle. Now, when you read each individual story account of this miracle, you will see that they are not identical. It's not copy-paste. It's not the same. They are different. Some gospel writers, they leave some details out, but others uh, have their own details that kind of augment the first story. So when you put them all together, each of the story gives extra details, right? So why it is important? Why it is important that each story gives extra details and maybe leaving out the details that the previous story mentioned, right? So they, they are not just, it's not carbon copy. It's not the exact same story. So why it's important? Um, so there is this uh, famous guy in the US, his last name is Wallace. So he is a detective, homicide detective. So, and he uh, uh, resolves uh, murders that happened 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And he's very good at that. He's very famous in the US. So he was an atheist at some point in his life, in, in his life and his wife was a Christian. So, and he decided to read the gospels and prove that they are all just made up stories. And then when he was reading, you know, the, the Gospels, he was, st he was struck by, by, the, by the similarity to, to what he experiences in his work as a detective. He says, when I work with eyewitnesses' accounts, all the stories, they are not identical because each person remembers something but doesn't remember something else. And exactly when they are not the exact match. This is exactly when you know that the story is true. Okay? When everybody tells exactly the same story, you know it's a lie. When the, everybody tells you the same story, but there are different elements to it, that means that they're telling the truth, right? When he was reading the Gospels, he noticed that. Okay, long story short, he became a Christian because of that, and she's now, he's now one of the uh, biggest apologists in, in the U.S., so he defends the Christian faith. He says it's beyond reasonable doubt that all this happened. So now, why it is important? Because Mark doesn't tell you why many were coming and going. And the Gospel of John, when it tells you about the same miracle, says it was Passover. Okay, now when it's Passover, it's one of the holidays, one of the holidays when all the Jews are supposed to go to Jerusalem. Josephus, uh, you know, a Roman historian, tells us that on average Passover, you would have about 3 million visitors to Jerusalem. 3 million. And they all are going to Jerusalem through Galilee. Other places as well, but mostly through Galilee. So, which means when it's Passover, you have crowds and crowds and crowds of people who go to Jerusalem. And this is exactly what they, these words mean. Many were coming and going because it was Passover. Isn't that interesting that they, God knew that this time, they will be able to reach out to many people from different countries, Jews, but those who are coming to, who are going to J Jerusalem, they will be able to reach out with the word of God and with the message that, you know, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent. You know, they, they didn't have radio or television, but all these people natu naturally were coming to them and going through their region, right? And they had an opportunity to interact with those people. And you tell this message to those people and they take it back home to their localities, right? And they spread the news. Isn't that amazing? So many people were coming and going and they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now, 
Many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. So people, when they saw the apostles leaving in the boat, they kind of figured out where the apostles go, and they ran to that place, you know, so that they can meet the apostles there, because they still wanted, you know, miracles and healings and all those things. Okay. And Jesus saw that crowd. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without shepherd. And this is another image which is very powerful. Those people who were flocking together, they were afflicted. They were suffering from sickness and disease and all kinds of problems and challenges. You know, and Jesus saw them as a as a sheep without shepherd. And we people today are exactly the same. Without God, without Jesus in our life, we're like sheep without shepherd. You know, we are afflicted and there is darkness and suffering and all kinds of things. And without Jesus, we're exactly like sheep without shepherd. Now, what's Jesus' reaction to these people? Now, remember 5,000 men not, uh, uh, excluding, you know, women and children. Ch children and women are not counted, just men. Where do we get so many people? Well, because they're all going to Jerusalem. There are like hundreds of thousands of people, right, going to Jerusalem. So there is this crowd, 5,000 5, people, 5,000 men. So, and, and Jesus had compassion on them. And he began to teach them many things. And you know what? This phrase that he began to teach them many things just uh, is eye-opening. Many people believe that, okay, I come to Jesus, I believe that he is my savior, and maybe I want him to bless me and protect my family so that everything is well. And that's enough for many people. But he was teaching. Jesus is also a teacher, which means uh, Bible studies. When we study the scriptures on ourselves, by ourselves at home, or when we come together and study the scriptures. This is what Jesus wants us to do. Because he's not just a savior, he's not just a king, he's also a teacher. He sees that crowd, he could have given them just what they wanted, healing, blessing, and, you know, food, and bye-bye. No, he's teaching them. So that is why we, we, we very often, we think, okay, I just get enough for myself, this is my faith, I have faith in myself, and that's enough for me. No, no, no. Jesus wants you to learn. He wants you to be a student of him. And that process will continue the whole life. Are you actually learning what he has to teach you? Or you just got a little bit and just, just walk with that little bit all your life? Not growing, not learning, okay? So th th this is not how Jesus wants us to be. So you see, he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place. This is a reasonable idea. He, the, his, his, his disciples are very reasonable, reasonable people. They say, this is a desolate place and the hour is now is late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy, uh, and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered to them, and what Jesus answers is just kind of crazy. He says, you give them something to eat. Is Jesus crazy? Thousands of people, and there are only 12 of them. How can you give them something to eat? What Jesus wants from them? Isn't their plan so reasonable and good? Let these people go to neighboring villages so that they can buy food, take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Jesus says, no, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And 200 denarii, it's, uh, it's a lot, a lot of money, thousands of dollars. Well, first, they don't have that kind of money, so they are not able to do that. What do you, Jesus, want from us? And then Jesus 
does the following. So you see this crowd, thousands of people, Jesus. Jesus is sitting here, he's depicted sitting, because I'm standing here. This is not biblical, by the way. One, the, the one who preaches should be sitting. And, so, and I'm standing. So this is, this, is, this, is, this is not biblical. Jesus is sitting. So this is how a teacher should, should, should teach. So Jesus is sitting, and he's sitting, and he's uh, preaching and teaching. And then he said to them, how many loaves uh, do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said five and two fish. So that's enough probably for them. Even for them, it's not too much. Two fish and five loaves, it's not too much. It's little. So now, then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass so that they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And again, you will see what Jesus does here. So he knows that there are many people and he wants his apostles to give to those people. Now, how it works. God gives to the apostles, the apostles give to the people. And this pattern, this model is working in our lives as well. He wants us Christians to bless people around us. He wants us Christians to be generous spiritually, emotionally, materially, financially. He wants us to bless those who are around us. You see what he's doing with the apostles? He doesn't want to tell the, the crowd, go and take care of yourself. He wants to show his love, care, compassion, generosity through his disciples. Who are his disciples today? It's us. He wants us. But when you look in your pocket, when you look around yourself, you say, I have just five loaves and two fish. That's barely enough even for me. I better keep it to myself. Right? But Jesus teaches his disciples that I can multiply what you have. I can bless what you have. Don't be afraid to be a blessing to other people. But we may be afraid, okay? We may be afraid because it's very reasonable to say, well, they should have taken or packed their breakfast or lunch or dinner with them. Where is their, where is their lunch box? They should have something in their lunch box. And they didn't plan accordingly. This is their problem. This is not my problem. This is their problem. Okay? Reasonable. But Jesus says, no, you give them it. Okay? Wow, we don't have much. And then Jesus multiplies what they have. Isn't that amazing? This is how he's working in this, in this world, through us, Christians. So, by the way, do you know that uh, the biggest portion of charity organizations in the U.S. is Christian? Christians are giving. And there is a huge problem because with all the current legislation, they want to some Christian uh, organizations to go against the basic principles of their faith. You know, with all this anti-discrimination stuff and LGBTQ and, and so on and so forth. They want to make certain Christian organization to go against the Christian faith and beliefs and convictions. So which means that many uh, charitable organizations, the chari ch charity organizations, they are not able to or may not be able to work in the U.S. But that's billions and billions of dollars, which the government, with all its programs, won't be able to provide to the needy. It's specifically non-for-profit organizations, and predominantly it's Christian organizations who give and take care you know, of the poor. Now, my question is, where do we Christians, how, how it happened to be, how it came to be, that it's Christians organizations that give, that's specifically because of Jesus, because he teaches us to take care of the poor and be a blessing and to be generous and to give, because God will provide if you 
do his will. Isn't that interesting? What Jesus is doing here, we can see it around us. So it's challenged today, you know, but still we can still still see those organizations here. So, but then another thing is um, Jesus is God of order, not disorder. He commanded them to sit down in groups. It's so interesting in groups, and, and the, the Greek word for groups is leek, this vegetable. Well, basically the word means like a garden beds. So there's, when you pass by any field and you see plants planted, right? They're not in disorder, right? There are rows. And the Greek word for those rows is groups, which means Jesus told them to, to be like these garden beds, like those, you know, leeks or, you know, onions or tomatoes, right? So in rows, so which again shows us that he is talking about harvest. He's harvesting, right? People are harvest. Okay, so that's very interesting. But also what happens he asked them to sit on the green grass. Why it's the green grass? Why do we have green grass here? Well, because in Israel, there is no green grass. The grass is yellow. What is happening here? Why it's green grass? Why it's important? Well, it's important because it's Passover time. And this is right after winter. And during winter in Israel, they have rains. And because of those many rains, the grass becomes green. Okay? It just tells you when it happened. It's another undesigned coincidence that this little detail that tells you that this story was not made up. It's a true story. So we know from the Gospel of John, it was Passover time. Mark, which is Peter's account, tells us about many people going through that region, but also it tells us about the green grass, and grass is green only when it's passed over. Isn't that amazing? Okay, he asks them to sit down, he divides them into groups, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish, uh, small baskets, because there are also large baskets, but these are relatively small baskets, hand baskets. Uh, and those who ate the loaves were five thousand men. So to sum up, uh, in this, in this uh, uh, gospel reading, we read about the relationship between the holy man, righteous people, uh, in our case Christians, and the government, which is not righteous at all, which can be perverted, right? So, and there is place for martyrdom in that tension, in that conflict. And this is what happens, you know, even to John the Baptist. And also we see that God wants to provide. He shows his love, compassion, and generosity. And he wants to bless. He wants to bless all those people, you know, who don't know him. He sees them as, as, as sheep without shepherd. And he wants to be their shepherd. But now how does Jesus bless them? He blesses them through us, through his people through the Christian, through the disciples. Back then it was the twelve, now it's us. And he teaches the twelve and us that you give to them, spiritually give to them, emotionally and materially. Be generous. Why? Why? Well, because through you God shows them that he's a good father. Through you he shows them his compassion and love and generosity. We are his hands. And we shouldn't be afraid to be generous, because if we do his will, he will multiply, he will bless. Isn't that amazing? Let us pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for John the Baptist, 
And we thank you that there are such people like John the Baptist who are not afraid to testify to the truth, who are not afraid of governments, of uh, all kinds of laws, mandates, uh, decisions, uh, not afraid to, 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 to be faithful to, to you, Jesus, to be faithful to the truth. Um, give us courage, Jesus, to be like, like John the Baptist, when and if the time comes. And also, Jesus, we ask you, please, um, help us be your hands in this world. Help us be generous. Help us um, be a blessing to this world. And help us see that you can provide, that you can provide and strengthen our faith. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.